preservation of and increased access to the 92nd Street Y Humanities Audio Archives is generously funded by the National Endowment for the Humanities. Good evening. I'm Laura Kaminsky, Associate Director of Education, and it's a pleasure to welcome you to the Y for tonight's special series, The Great Conductors. This series developed out of the desire to provide on our lecture platform here at the Y an opportunity for the public to hear from leading conductors about their work, their own personal backgrounds, and their perspectives on the contemporary music scene. As an institution deeply involved in the presentation of orchestral, choral, and chamber concerts, it is also our pleasure to be able to present a series such as this, where ideas about music, repertoire and programming, interpretation, risk-taking, financial considerations of concert presentation, and the like are discussed and evaluated by those whose life work, life struggle, and life satisfactions are completely engaged in the production of musical events of the highest quality. Tonight marks the third night of this series, which opened last fall with Lucas Foss and Gerard Schwartz talking with Tim Page about their work. For those of you who were with us here in the fall, welcome back to our new friends, welcome, and a word about the format. Following these introductory remarks, Tim Page and Leonard Slatkin will engage in conversation of about one hour in duration, after which you will have the opportunity to pose your questions. Mr. Page will recognize you one at a time. If you stand while speaking, your questions will be clearly heard by all. It is my honor to introduce to you our moderator, Mr. Tim Page, currently a music critic for the New York Times and host of a daily radio program broadcast over WMYC entitled Old, New, and Unexpected. He is also the host and producer of a new nationally syndicated radio program, Meet the Composer. In 1984, the Glenn Gould Reader was published by Knopf, a book edited by Mr. Page, which included his own introduction and a reprint of one of his interviews with the late pianist. From 1979 to 1982, Mr. Page was the classical music editor for the Soho News. Since then, he has been a regular contributor to the New York Times, often reviewing as many as 13 performances per week, in addition to feature assignments. He received the ASCAP Deems Taylor Award for Music Criticism in 1983. Mr. Page attended the Manus College of Music and Columbia University and spent three summers at Tanglewood as a piano and composition student. Our guest tonight, Leonard Slatkin, is a man who dares to program Schoenberg and Steve Reich on the first half of a New York concert and who expects that the audience will not walk out. Born in 19... <laughs> he liked that. <laughs> Born in 1944 in Los Angeles, Mr. Slatkin comes by his musicality honestly and genetically. His father was a conductor and violinist, and his mother played the cello. In 1978, Leonard Slatkin became the first American music director in the 100-year history of the St. Louis Symphony. His musical education includes study at Indiana University School of Music, the Juilliard School, and the Aspen Music Festival. He has studied viola, composition, and piano, as well as conducting. His early conducting credits include, include debuts with the New York Philharmonic, the Chicago Symphony, St. Louis Symphony, the Concertgebouw in Amsterdam, the Boston Symphony, Minnesota, New Orleans, and many others. He has toured with orchestras, including the St. Louis Symphony, visiting cities throughout the United States, Europe, Scandinavia, the Soviet Union. Mr. Slatkin conducted his first concert with the St. Louis Symphony Orchestra on October 13, 1968, in the capacity of assistant conductor. In 1971, he was named associate conductor, in 1975, principal guest conductor, and in 1979, he was appointed music director and conductor. Maestro Slatkin has championed contemporary music and music by fellow American composers during his tenure with the St. Louis Symphony Orchestra at the same time that he has led the orchestra to new heights in its artistic development. We are honored that he is here with us tonight. Please join me in welcoming our moderator, Tim Page, and our guest, Leonard Slatkin. Thank you.
Good evening. Thanks very much for coming. Uh, it's good to see you all again after our fall version of this program, and it's my very great pleasure to be talking with Leonard Slatkin here tonight. Um, I'm going to start with the questions that I asked of Lucas Foss and Jerry Schwartz back in October, uh, partially because they gave very, very different answers, and also because it's been a long time and maybe we need some refreshing of our memory, which is basically that when people go to a concert, I, I've spoken with people afterwards, and one of the things which I am almost inevitably asked um, if if people feel at ease enough that they're not somehow making a fool of themselves, is what exactly does a conductor do? They're, they're rather baffled by it. They see orchestras like uh, Calais Amarium or the Orpheus Chamber Orchestra, and they're up there and they're functioning without a conductor, or they see maybe some small Baroque orchestra and they, a few cues from the first violin will somehow take care of everything. So what is it that, um, that uh, makes it necessary for a conductor. Why exactly is a conductor needed to cohere this group of 50 to 110 or whatever people? Uh, tell us. I've sometimes used the slightly uh, unusual analogy of saying a conductor is very similar to what a coach or a manager in baseball or football is, and that their work is primarily done during practice sessions or time that is not spent on the field. When you have any ensemble in which there are more than usually 10, 12 people, somebody somewhere has to say, this is the way it's going to go. Otherwise, you get what you get in the Israel Philharmonic. You show up, you give a downbeat, and you get 102 opinions about what your phrase is. Um, so somebody has got to say, this is how fast this performance is going to be, and this is how loud I want this, and this is our phrasing here. So that's the first thing. We're the coach. But also, when you have a large aggregation, it is physically impossible for everybody to hear each other. Assuming it's an orchestra where all your violins are to your left and your cellos are to your right, and the winds and brass are in the back and the percussion is scattered someplace, they can't hear each other. So the conductor functions there as what is sometimes called a traffic cop, keeping it together. But the bottom line of it all is that it's the conductor's job, when you come to a performance, to mold the whole thing, to make it shape as one, if one wants to use the word inspire, the one thing you cannot really say how it's done. Without a conductor, and you know the NBC symphony after Toscanini died, did try to go on for a while being a full-size symphony orchestra without a conductor. And the symphony of the air. Symphony of the air, and it, it didn't last too long. And as it was, the concertmaster wound up being the conductor. The concertmaster would say, this is how it's going to go. In a string quartet, generally it is the first violinist who says, this is the way we'll do things. They argue for an hour, and it usually winds up being the way the first violinist wanted in the first place. Um, a conductor really is the leader just like in any business organization. And to a certain degree, I always feel funny when somebody says that the conductor did a particularly inspired performance because there's no inspired performance without the people who are playing it. But hopefully the conductor makes them all think as one unit. And physically, they need to see the person there just to keep it all together. It's funny because I've read somewhere, uh, somebody once went on the record, and I'm trying very hard right now to remember who it was who said this, but I read it and I actually personally thought it was preposterous, but, um, and so did the person who was arguing with, with whoever said this, but that there were no bad orchestras, only bad conductors. <laughs> that somehow, yes, I've seen somehow that we could, uh, yeah, I'm sure you've seen the, the uh, truism. Um, is that so? I, I don't believe <laughs> I've conducted some orchestras where they must, I must have been terrible. <laughs> case. But, but what would happen, say, if we got together a, an orchestra, and I'm not saying people who'd never played before, no, no Portsmouth Sinfonia here, yeah. but one of these things where you, where you had an orchestra of uh, fairly competent players, um, do you think you could make music with them within, uh, say, a half an hour or so? Or no, could, what you'd you get is a good accumulation of human beings who you might in a half hour get to play somewhat together, but without any conception of what a whole piece of music is going to sound like. I mean, you would just be spending a lot of your time saying, I would like this down bow, mm -hmm. or I would like this kind of vibrato, or I'd like it this loud. I find as a guest, and maybe we'll get into it later, the difference between being a guest conductor and a music director. 
as a guest, if you just come to an orchestra and do one week, and say you have four rehearsals to put together a program, you have to make a decision at your first rehearsal when you are just going through the music, whether you are going to need to spend the time to hone the technical end of things, the keeping it together, or whether you relate to the orchestra well enough you can get into the musical ends. And they are two very different elements. Uh, I know that when I go to Europe, I unfortunately spend most of the time just saying, violin slowly, well, let's do this again, and please play in this part of the bow, and winds, let's tune this. Um, fortunately, here in this country, when I get together with some of the fine ensembles, with first rehearsal after you've played through the piece, you're then already talking about, let's all breathe together here, um, I'd like this a little softer, and you get them to think alike. I think if you get a group of people together, and you see it in this city, maybe more than other cities, where there are many orchestras who are thrown together freelance orchestras, they tend, unless it's somebody very special in front of them, to sound alike from every performance. A good, competent reading of a piece of music with no particular distinction of, or individuality of sound emanating from the podium. That is the nature of the beast when a person doesn't have a chance to work with an ensemble, and especially when many people have seen a different conductor every week. Imagine a corporation which has a different president every week who has his or her own ideas. By the time the employees would get used to the ideas, a new person is coming in and there would be no real sense of direction. It's something like that. And then how do orchestras like Orpheus and like Calais or Mariam work where they don't really have a conductor? Do they just automatically choose somebody, say the concertmaster, to make these decisions and then he makes them or he or she makes them during rehearsals? Um, and then they play without um, direction at the end. I'm going to assume that. I don't know how those two operate, but we do know another example would be the Academy of Ancient Music, mm -hmm. which is obviously a specialized style, but all of the recordings either say it's either Christopher Hogwood or Jaap Schroeder, and it doesn't list either of them as conductor, but something else, whatever, artistic something, administrator. Yeah. And it's very clear that one person is making some decisions, probably with some feedback from some others. I would imagine with Orpheus or any other group of 30 that somebody has to say, this is how it's going to go. I, I don't know for sure, though. And you touched a moment ago about playing with different ensembles. Do orchestras have set personalities? I mean, obviously, the men and women who play in the orchestras have set personalities. But would you say that there is a marked difference between, say, uh, and I'm, I'm not calling value judgments into question here, between, say, the San Francisco Symphony, the St. Louis Symphony, and um, the New York Philharmonic. Yeah. One is tempted to say that the great orchestras of the world are those orchestras who play with distinctive personalities on the positive side. I mean, I know orchestras that are really lousy, and we could say they have a distinctive personality, and that's not what we're talking about here. But, you know, we used to talk about something called the Philadelphia sound. I'm sure you all heard that phrase, or the Ormandy sound, whatever it would be. We all knew what it was, even if we couldn't put it into words. Or we would talk about the sound that Toscanini got from his orchestra. There is the sound of the Berlin Philharmonic. Uh, other orchestras that, that somehow achieve a very high level, we talk about their sound. If one goes into detail, you know, you can say, yes, Philadelphia was known because of the very luxuriant string sound, and uh, Chicago Symphony was known because of the very brilliant-sounding brass section, and, and down the line with many, many orchestras. I think, indeed, whether we like it or not, the great orchestras of the world are the ones that have that identifiable personality. And that creates another problem, because do we make that personality go from one style into the next? meaning that do we apply Brahmsian principles of one orchestra into a Mozart symphony, or do we try to play Mozart in such a different style that the orchestra loses its individuality, shall we say? It's a big problem these days, especially, because conductors are on very uh, opposite sides, and, and the uh, authentic uh, research that's being done has added all kinds of wrinkles to that. I think, and it's an old-fashioned view, I would just assume have my own orchestra, for instance, play with a degree of uniformity through all the different styles, even if it's at the slight sacrifice of authenticity. Somehow, a great composer is a great composer, no matter 
how you play it. So if we choose to play Bach with vibrato, it still sounds like Bach. It doesn't sound like anybody else. But with my orchestra, we might play it. It still could be the St. Louis Symphony. Or if it was New York and they played a certain way, it's the New York Philharmonic. The idea to me that all orchestras adjust stylistically to so-called authentic practices takes away the individuality of the orchestra. So I think the great orchestras do, in my mind, maintain a large degree of um, personality. Do you trim down your orchestra when you play Bach or oh, Mozart? Yeah. We make certain adjustments, but we can't make um, the massive adjustments that you hear on records. For instance, Bach did not play in halls for 2,700 people. He might have played in a cathedral, and there might have been 2,700 people there, but he didn't play in Carnegie Hall. Also, as I un imagine, Bach didn't do any recordings with 24 tracks either, and Bach's audience probably didn't listen with 1986 ears either. So we make certain adjustments. Mozart, you play, if it's early Mozart, not so heavy, perhaps with 12 first violins and 10 seconds and maybe six violas and four celli and two basses. If it's a larger piece like a C minor piano concerto, perhaps the big G minor symphony, maybe another extra stand here and there. And you try to get everybody to play a little lighter, perhaps, not to play with the same kind of heavy stroke you might find in a later Beethoven symphony and certainly not with the same kind of strokes you'd find in Brahms or Schumann. Um, so those kind of adjustments, yes. In that sense, times have changed. We adjust size of orchestras, but I think the smart people, for the most part, also adjust to the environment in which they are performing itself. It makes very little sense to me, and I know what happens in cities, for a string quartet to play in a huge auditorium, because they're, what are they going to do? Play uh, a Beethoven quartet as if they were playing in a hall this size? Are they supposed to recreate how a quartet might have sounded in Beethoven's time for an audience that was there. We all have this kind of judgment and decision to make. I think we have to do it based on our own taste. And I know for myself, I will pare down my forces as I feel it necessary to convey the texture of the music, but I don't do it exclusively with the knowledge that, yes, that's how they did it back then. It's not really uh, quite as relevant as a lot of people make it out to be for me. We speak about the different sounds of orchestra, the, uh, the brilliance of the Chicago brass and the creamy sound uh, we associate with Ormandy and Stokowski. Um, what would be the Slatkin sound? If you could, if you could put together a, a specific sound, and, I, and you have to yeah. some degree with, with St. Louis, but if you were making your ideal orchestra, describe it for me as a critic might. Yeah. As I, a good critic might. <laughs> <laughs> I tend to follow indeed the approach in the string playing of, of what the old stakovsky ormandy approach was with a good smattering of the Boston Kusevitsky days. Now, I was not really around during those days, but from reports and from people that I know, the idea was that the orchestra first of all emanates from the strings. If we go through the majority of orchestral history and we assume that we're talking from Bach onwards and not much before, we find very few pieces in the repertoire that do not have strings. But we find many pieces that don't have any winds and certainly plenty that don't have percussion. So the bottom fundament is the strings itself. So I'm always present that the strings, and always aware rather, that the strings have to be heard throughout a piece of music. I find even in Bruckner, Mahler, Stravinsky, when the winds are going full blast, the triple forte, I still would like to be able to hear the strings to a certain degree. So that's the first thing. The second thing about the string playing is I don't think, unless a composer specifically calls for it, string playing should be particularly rough. It's not to say not aggressive. You can be aggressive, but uh, rough is another matter. Rough is um, a kind of method of attacking the instrument which goes against the traditions of the way most string players are taught and against, I believe, the traditions of how most composers are writing. So I tend to go for a slightly smoother sound, even in very short, loud passages. Rough for me is an effect. It comes in once in a while and the composer specifically calls for it. And many, many pieces do call for it. In Mahler, you'll see the term rash, or you'll see um, Puccini, uh, Ruvido, or something like this, that 
indicates this sound. So since they took the trouble to let us know when they want the sound, should we assume that if they didn't write it, they didn't want that sound? It's, I think, valid. That's, so the strings is the first part. The second element is that the other instruments of the orchestra have to be able, one, to blend with themselves, and two, to blend into that string sound. So for me, homogeneity is a key to orchestral playing. Uh, I don't prefer, for my own orchestra, even though I have some extremely brilliant wind soloists and an incredible amount of uh, virtuosic percussion players, I don't really want people after they hear a concert or myself to say, boy, what a great first clarinet. I, I don't think of it that way. I'd like to think of how well everybody blends into the overall. Um, in a funny way, I don't want people to say how well in tune we play, because that's an indication that maybe we didn't play well in tune or we're being compared in a funny way. It's, it's all a question of blend. When a composition does call for some uh, particularly beautiful solo work from the winds, of course, one wants to give them the flexibility to play in whatever manner they feel is appropriate within a given style. This past weekend we had symphonies of both Dvorak and Schubert where there are prominent wind solos and sure enough, I trust my wind players enough to stop conducting at those moments, let everybody else listen to them and fit into that. But for the most part what I'm doing is trying to meld the winds into what the strings are doing. Percussion represent a slightly different um, problem because percussion playing per se hasn't come into its own until this century and really hasn't come into its own until the last 25, 30 years when the percussion section began to take on individual solistic characteristics and composers are now treating percussion writing as they used to treat um, trumpet and clarinet as being solistic as well as integral. Still, when you play the majority of the standard work where you've got uh, bass drum and cymbals and triangles and things like that. Also for me, because it's no not a novelty anymore, it should blend in. However, if you go back and look at early works, either Abduction of Seraglio or Ninth Beethoven for that matter, where the introduction of percussion was a novelty, then you highlight it. Another example of that kind of featuring where you might not normally think of it in a symphony like the G major of Dvorak, where Dvorak, I guess for almost the only time, calls for horn trills. This was a sort of new effect at the time. So it must have been shocking for the audience back then and therefore we try to emphasize that this was a new effect then and we'll let you hear it now as it might have been heard back then as a new effect and bring it out. But for the most part, the whole ensemble is to, for me, meant to be drawn in as one. And I'd, I'd like to think that we're pretty close to accomplishing that objective uh, with my bunch anyway and several other orchestras in the world too. What interests me in your description is that you are approaching the building of an orchestra with the, um, with the ideals of a chamber musician rather than a virtuoso. Well, it's it sort of understandable right. in my case. <laughs> uh, yeah, I was going to mention that. Uh, since you grew up in a house with one of America's great string quartets, the Hollywood String Quartet, and I wonder if, if you want to touch at all on, um, on the, the fact that you grew up really around chamber music, because this does strike me as very, very different from some conductors where the virtuosity is all. You often have this feeling that it's, it's almost sportive, the way the, the different sections are all trying to vie with each other for preeminence. And with you, there's a much, much more of a sense of temperance. You, um, you seem to prize a blending and a lack of ostentation. Yeah, the conductor's job, before we get into that, is for me to get out of the way. Don't, uh, I don't like to either read about how good I did or anything like that. It doesn't mean very much to me. What, what I care about is how the orchestra itself is perceived. And I think of myself as being, in my case, the 102nd member of a 102-member ensemble. When I was growing up, which is a continuing process, I hope, I was very fortunate to have a resident string quartet in my house so that from very early ages, the first music that I was hearing was of a very high order. I mean, not many children get used to hearing late Beethoven quartets and Bartok and Brahms and Schumann and plus which my uncle was a fabulous pianist, so I heard that and studied with him. I had that sound and I saw that kind of interaction 
between players. And it, it, I guess it's a little strange to think about it, but as much as I love the repertoire that I get to do day in, day out, I'm always envious of fine string players who get to play that repertoire, which still is unsurpassed. Uh, nobody's here saying that the Beethoven Nine symphonies are not towering masterpieces, but somehow the late string quartets tower above that. And in Brahms, uh, you, you just don't, in the symphonies, quite come to the same level that you do in, say, the A minor uh, quartet or the clarinet quintet or the, even the piano quintet, I suppose. And most composers, most, who dealt both in symphonic music and chamber music, I, I think I'm very jealous that I can't sit in a quartet and do that. I guess the best we can do is perhaps deal with uh, playing a quartet in, an, in orchestral guise, but it's not quite the same thing. I, I do come to the repertoire of symphonic music with the quartet sound having been in my, my background. Also the fights and arguments that ensue among a quartet. Um, I never saw four people quite yell like that. Uh, I, that part I tried to keep out of it. It doesn't do much good to have the whole string section yelling back at me. Uh, so I, I kept that part out of it. But I think I was able to watch the dynamics of four outstanding musicians come to grips with basic problems. When a quartet first sits together, they sit down, play through a Haydn quartet, and you know, again, like we were saying earlier, usually the first violinist calls the shots, and boom, that's the tempo, and they more or less set the tone, and, and then they start in on the piece, everybody chiming in with their ideas. Um, and, and you learn a lot from that. I know that uh, maybe it even extends further than my, my parents, because in my family, at least three generations of my family are cellists, and I think maybe in a funny way, when I conduct, sometimes I lean too much to my right because I'm just more into that sound, and I'm, I, I got used to that more frequently than I did the violin or viola. Although I did play violin and viola, I didn't play uh, cello. Well, there were people who argue I couldn't play violin and viola either, but uh, it was a big influence. And I think anybody who grows up in a musical household cannot help but be influenced and take what they hear as a youngster into their later musical development. Well, leaving aside the uh, Grosse Fuga and orchestral <laughs> transcription for a moment, um, let's talk about what are the dream pieces for you to play. What are the pieces which are really genuinely a thrill? And, uh, and thrills can be of many, many different sorts. There can obviously be something which is, uh, I guess thrill is not quite the word, but something which is very spiritually moving to you to conduct. I can think of a lot of pieces which would qualify yeah. for that. Also, there must be some which are just a tremendous amount of fun to play or, or greatly exciting. Tell me what some of the conductor um, favorites are and why. Yeah, for me, they, they do fall into different categories. Some are outright fun. Um, some are fun because after doing them many times, they become, you can play around with them on stage as you go along. Um, Tchaikovsky Five would fall into that category. Or... Um, if that's fun, it uh, seems like such oh, a yeah. confessional work. The fifth? Yeah. I think when you do it with an or I've, we've done it a lot in St. Louis, and it's one of those pieces that you don't have to say anything. In fact, it's a piece that when the orchestra knows how it goes, it's better not to rehearse it. It's actually better to get on stage and just play and see what happens. Try to react to each other. That's what makes it fun for me. Um, another piece like that would be... Brahms too is like that. Mm -hmm. Brahms II is another piece which can withstand a variety of approaches at a given moment. Is, um, is this because the various members of the orchestra could play it in their sleep, in their deepest dreams? Kind so of. So they, they can be a little kind more improvisatory? Once in a while, when, especially when you're on tour and you're playing the same pieces several times, you will purposely go out there, and I might have warned a few people in advance, I'd say, keep your eyes on me, I, I might try a few things tonight. And then you get really nifty performances. They may be totally out of the musical ballpark, but they're a lot of fun because everybody's just kind of seeing what's going to happen. I remember uh, we did, um, last year on our European tour, we played Fifth Prokofiev Symphony a lot. And we'd recorded it, and it, it's a piece that 
it's also a fun piece to do. It's very difficult, but it's a fun piece to do, but not a lot. You can get tired of this piece. And we had reached the point where we just had played it almost too much. And I decided that one night I'm going to just take it a little bit out of whack. All of a sudden, slow movements became a little quicker and fast movements became a little slower and places where I hadn't taken retards took retards. And um, you could see people sort of just going, uh-oh, what's going to happen now? And you get a real kind of electric feeling from everybody uh, when the ensemble's good. I think some orchestras would resent it, probably, if you, if, especially European orchestras. If you rehearse it one way and play it one way, they don't want you to change. That's, that's it. Um, so some pieces like that are, they're fun for me anyway. Other pieces are more demanding and I wouldn't attach the word fun. They're challenging. Last year, my biggest challenge last year of the repertoire was to do the B minor mass of Bach, which I had never done, and which I worked very, very hard just to come up with an approach. How was I going to do this piece? How am I going to reconcile it with all the research being done in authentic performance? Uh, you know, every bar there's a decision. Bach leaves us virtually no dynamics. We have to make decisions on every bar and how loud it is, what our balances are like, what the size of the chorus is for each section. And um, so I found that satisfying when it was over because it wasn't too bad. I felt I would like to do this again and I might have something to say about it. Other pieces, no. Other pieces which I thought I would have fun with have been monumental disasters for me. Uh, pieces that I didn't think would be. Don Juan of Strauss is a piece that I've done twice now with, for me, totally disastrous results. I don't know why. I can't do that piece. It sounds lousy. So I, it goes on the shelf. Um, How does it sound lousy? I mean... I, I, I think I know it inside out. When I finish the performance, I go off so I, saying, what did I do? Why? What happened? I didn't get from point A to point Z at all. I made little bits and pieces out of this. Is it possible that that's just a personal perception? Have you heard a playback? I don't want to hear it. I, I, I think I have to feel comfortable when I do it. But, but haven't you sometimes uh, gone out there and played something which you felt was really phenomenally wonderful for you personally, and perhaps you didn't quite get as much of that across? I, I would assume that sometimes th there was a maxim by the, the Roman author Horace who, which said, uh, if you are going to make me cry, you must cry yourself. I don't believe that at all. No. I think that people can go out there and not believe a word of it and make it very, very beautiful. And then on, on another occasion, perhaps, they might go out there and, and really have a vast emotional experience and have it leave everybody else cold. That indeed can happen. I know in one case, uh, maybe 10 years ago, we, uh, when I was still an assistant in St. Louis, we did a Tchaikovsky 6, and we were just beginning to tape our concerts for broadcast. And I, I never, no, well, can't forget the program. King Stephen Overture, Lontano of Ligeti, Hindemith Violin Concerto with uh, George Pauk, Intermission, Tchaikovsky 6. First concert that they'd ever taped, we're going to put this thing on the air. Tchaikovsky 6 was over, and I thought, Tchaikovsky was standing next to me. I thought this thing was so terrific and pulled into some place. And next day, I come running back to the hall. I said, I got to hear this. I got to, went up to the recording room. Uh, I'd like to hear the first half. And I said, no, no, I don't want to hear the first half. I want to hear the Tchaikovsky. It was, it was really good. No, no, why don't you listen to the first half? And I, I said, I don't want to hear the first half. Put it on. Two bars in it. Turn it off. Get out of here. You, sometimes your perception on the stage has nothing to do with how it actually goes. Nothing. But somehow, I guess, maybe if you felt you were moved, something must have happened. Maybe it just happened to you. And maybe that's enough. But at least while I was on stage for the 46, 47 minutes it took, something happened to me that was important. And so now, I'm not so anxious to hear right away something that I've done. I usually wait if I'm going to hear it at all. When I make a record, we have to listen to the playbacks just to approve things, but I generally don't put it on unless I'm listening for something specific. I, I don't want to know. I, uh, and you change. You do a performance, and next day you, you go out, and if you to repeat, you do it again. There's going to be something different about it. The best thing you can do maybe in listening to your own performances is to say, okay, I grew a little bit the next performance, or I faded and I didn't 
grow from it. Uh, maybe it's hard for us individually to make that assessment, but I've been pretty good about it. So what will you do with a piece like Don Juan? What will you do with a piece that does not come naturally to you? Not do it. <laughs> uh, I'll have to get back to it at some point. Um, it's, it's a hard question, you know. Maybe it's the burden that a music director has, which is very sad. We are expected to do everything. You know, somehow the specialists aren't. If somebody says, yes, I'm a, I, I play, I specialize in playing the trio sections of Haydn Symphony minuets, and they do those very well. Um, you know, but somehow if they say that's what we do, that's all they have to do. But music directors, we're supposed to do everything. Every time we get out there, it's supposed to be great. And then if, if I was to do a season at home and say, just do the Russian Romantics, that's all I did for a whole season, that what would be, oh, what kind of conductor is this? What kind of music director is this? So it's a, it's a bit of a problem. I think we can't avoid any piece that's within the standard repertoire, but we have to be honest to ourselves. I find at home that if there are works, Bruckner is a good example, I don't do very much, again, because I just don't feel I do it very well. And so I assign that to guest conductors who I think do a good job with it and can teach the orchestra more properly than I can. Um, I'm just beginning to feel my way through the operatic repertoire. I do it both in the opera house now and in, with my orchestra. But I know what I don't do well. I will never in my life do Lucia de Lamamore very well. And I, I just know that. So I probably won't do it at all. I may try an aria to see if it's any good, but I doubt very much that I'll do it. You mentioned that if you played nothing but the Russian romantic repertory, people might say, well, what kind of music director is this? I, I hate to say this about a lot of audiences, but I think there are many audiences which would be thrilled if you played <laughs> nothing but the Russian romantics. Yeah. And one of the things which I admire as somebody who is very, very interested and involved with contemporary music is that I would assume you must be, if not at the very, very top, certainly right up there with the leading proponents of 20th century music. And what also excites me about your work with, um, with 20th century music is that you play many, many different kinds of 20th century music. You've just played the Arnold Schoenberg Piano Concerto. You've just played some music by Steve Reich. Uh, you've played music by Joseph Schwantner. You've, you've even played music that you have admitted you don't like very yes. much, like the Elliott Carter <laughs> yes. Symphony of Three Orchestras. But I didn't admit it until after I did it. I, I, that I can't do. Um, no performer really should walk out there convinced that something is lousy and then present it to an audience. If, as you're working on it and you've made a commitment to it, uh, you find you're not at one with it, you somehow have to talk yourself into it to say, I'm going to do the best I can with it, I'll present it as well as I can, and for the X amount of time it takes to do it, rehearse it, prepare it, I will like it. Uh, I can't explain it other than that. You simply have to do that. Otherwise, you're not doing a service to anybody. First of all, the composer. Oh, well. I get criticized a lot, though, because of the music I don't do. You know, Which a is? lot of people say that, yeah, Slatkin does a lot of contemporary music. But then a lot of people say, yes, but he does the not very intellectual contemporary music. I don't do Milton Babbitt, and I don't do Morton Feldman, and I don't do... Um, well, Babbitt's written very, very little for well, the orchestra. Well, but I don't do it. Uh -huh. <laughs> so I, I, Carter's pretty intellectual, and, and you, you gave I did one piece, and next year I'll try one more. <laughs> um, you gave a very fine yeah, well, performance, too. Yeah. We worked on it very hard. And I, after it was over, I, I just wasn't satisfied with the piece, and it's hidden there. It's not like Don Juan. This is, not, this is a case where I did one, it went well, and goodbye. How often does this happen, that you work not on a piece too and, much. and you end up not liking it that not, much? Not too much anymore. In general, I'm not put in the position of having to do a piece. In that particular case, it was a matter of bribery, which caused me to place it. Uh, it's, it's too long to go into, but it was done in Chicago, and it was part of a series of pieces for which the Chicago Symphony was receiving a very hefty amount of money, as were other orchestras, to play six pieces that were commissioned in the Bicentennial. And this was the one piece they hadn't played, and they were not going to get all of the money from the government until they played it. Um, and Sir George Schulte said, no, he, he wouldn't do it. And 
uh, their associate conductor, he wouldn't do it, and uh, Mr. Abado, who was their principal guest conductor, he wouldn't do it. And for three years, I said I wouldn't do it. And then finally, after I said I need six rehearsals for this, plus some other things, um, I said I'd do it. Also, they, were, they had been so kind to me, the Chicago Symphony, over the years that I felt I owed this much to them to help them get some money. Well, it's um, an important piece. One it's way an important or the other, piece. Anyway. It's an important piece, and I have no qualm about saying that this is an important voice, an important composer that must be heard, and probably the piece must be heard, but I'm in no position to judge that mm -hmm. at this point. I just said I would do it. I worked like a dog to learn this thing because it involves all kinds of um, conductorial principles that I'd never gotten used to before, what they call metric modulation and oh, just, just the whole logistics of the piece uh, that were really quite complicated and a great challenge and I took it at that. And I worked on it very hard with the orchestra and after the three performances, I just said, no, I found myself conducting this work very much as an intellectual exercise rather than a piece of music. And I, uh, so I wasn't satisfied. I will leave it for somebody else who has the feeling inside them, on this part of the inside, not this part, to do it properly. You know, then maybe there's something to be said. Mm -hmm. But I, I have very little, uh, I have grudging admiration for people who technically can get through these things, but who don't feel a note of it. And that, that bothers me. In fact, if, if there's one general statement that one can make these days, there's just too many people out there who don't, who are conducting more with their head than they are with their heart. And that's, it's just too widespread now. So you basically believe that one should conduct what one loves or at least feels an affinity towards. And believes in, yeah. So the contemporary music that I do tends to be a little more conservative in nature, but more than that, tends to be immediately accessible to an audience on a first hearing, if not necessarily comprehensible, understandable. And those two things, they may sound like contradictions, but they're not. For instance, even with a work like we played the other night of Steve Reich, everybody in the audience could listen to this piece. But I doubt very much that most people understood what the principles were that go into making up this kind of music. But it's very easily, easily assimilated and it's accessible. Whether it's good or not is for people later, in later years to decide. We can't judge immediately what's a great work and what isn't. Um, the most of the works I do, I tend to think people will get some emotional response going. I remember years ago in New York when I was a student going to a concert at Lincoln Center where Stravinsky was conducting, maybe his last concert here, and he was premiering some of his recent works, which had not been heard in New York, and this was at a time when he was sort of uh, playing between trying to be Stravinsky in language, but trying to follow ideas that Schoenberg had set up. Again, we're still not quite sure if it has worked or not, and again, it'll take a few more years to decide. Um, but the main point of this concert was these pieces were greeted with a round of apathy like you couldn't believe. And here was Igor Stravinsky, the legend in our time, in our century, being greeted politely. And perhaps rather than a response of enthusiasm or a response of anger, the worst thing we can get on the stage from an audience is polite and apathetic. And I would just assume play music, which is either going to anger an audience, which I've done once in a while, but that I believed in, or play works which an audience is going to appreciate on hearing it there, but that provokes some sort of response other than, thank you very much. This is not what music is about. It's not. What is your audience response like to the amount of contemporary music you play? St. Louis is not thought of, uh, and perhaps this is incorrect of me to assume this, but it's not usually thought of as a, uh, a city that's very much into the avant-garde. Um, yeah, and that, I would say, is true key. generally of the whole Midwest, yeah. except for the two coasts, the so-called avant-garde isn't there, unless it's a university. Mm -hmm. um, what we do, and uh, it's hard to speak for colleagues so much, but we, we play a fair amount of what would be called contemporary music. It ranges from small pieces, uh, 
two very large ones. You know, we have no problem with playing the third Ludoslavsky symphony or the fourth Michael Tippett symphony, important works of our time. We get around to usually within three or four years after they're written, or if, if not right away, or if not being responsible for them per se. Um, I find that if I have difficulty responding to the work as a listener in understanding it, I know the audience will have the same problem, so I take the time to talk to the audience about it. I try to talk to them more in the idea and spirit of, here are the ideas the composer is presenting to you, and it's not our job to make a judgment whether this is a good piece or a bad piece or whatever, but it is our job to see if under the guidelines the composer has set up, if they have indeed stuck by them and succeeded at that or not. That's really about all we can do in judging a new piece of music, because history will, will judge it, not, not the audience that hears it the first time. So we recently played a piece in December by a young, very young English composer named Stephen Martland, who nobody here knows, and I won't go into how we found the piece, but it was a half hour long work, uh, subtitled Baba Yar. There's a work of Shostakovich with the same title. It has to do with a, a German concentration camp in Russia. Uh, and what this young man did was to, in very harsh terms for almost the duration of the work, try to depict what might have been the emotional uh, situation there, but barraging constantly at you, and a very, not only hard to play, but real hard to listen to, I thought. So I took some time with the audience to talk about this, and we demonstrated some of the principles that he used to create the effect. And I, I did say that, look, it's a long work, and if you find your mind wandering away from the musical elements, try to at least keep in mind the imagery that the composer is suggesting. And I was very gratified that the response of the audience was really enthusiastic in a positive way. They were not upset, um, to the point of, of um, booing it. They were somewhat vociferous in a piece that would be challenging for any audience, any place. So I found that a helpful word or two, which is sometimes resented by people who think they know it all, but seems to be appreciated by those like me who don't know it all. So I, I've never had much of a problem audience relationships between uh, conductor and audience. What about conductor and orchestra? Have you ever been suddenly put before an orchestra which for some reason or another just refused to really play well for you where there was some kind of anger? Because it would seem to me a conductor is in a terribly vulnerable position. He can coach everybody and make everything work wonderfully and then if a few people in the orchestra decide that they're going to raise havoc with the performance, they can easily do that, and yeah. nobody can really stop them, at least until the next union meeting. I've never had a performance sabotage, but I can give you an example of, of a place where it didn't go right. Uh, a relationship between a conductor and an orchestra, be it a music director or as a guest, is a very special thing. And we all start out in our careers thinking, well, I can get along with everybody. And the answer is, in any relationship, is you can't get along with anybody, and everybody, rather. One place in particular, and that was for me with the Concertgebouw in Amsterdam, which of course is one of the great orchestras of the world. Um, I got there, program was Haydn 97, Dans Sacre Profane, Debussy, and Shostakovich 10, a program which normally people would say, well, that's right up his alley, it'll go fine. And it probably is not such a bad program for them either. They don't do much Shostakovich, but that's all right. And I started rehearsing and I couldn't, I just couldn't connect. I didn't feel right about it. And the performances reflected that. It was a kind of so-so result, not, not very distinguished. And I felt, gee, I just, this just didn't go right at all. And later I was told by one member of the orchestra that I committed a, an error in my rehearsal technique with them. And I said, but I'm, I'm good, I, I, I'm, that I know I can do, I can rehearse well. And he said, yeah, but you know, you stopped us a lot to tell us that something was good. I do that, I will, as much as I will criticize, I will take the time to say, 
that's good. That solo is fine. This intonation is fine. And they didn't want to hear that at all. He said, we're not interested in knowing when it's fine. You tell us when it's wrong and that's it. And that's why that relationship didn't work. And if they were ever to ask me back again, I would still rehearse the same way. I can't adjust the other way. I find it important for people to get as much uh, praise as they do criticism. I, well, how would you like to be in an orchestra all every day and said, too flat, too loud, too soft? Ugh. So I, I think both ends are helpful. Another orchestra, which although the performance turned all right, but I didn't uh, feel much rapport with, was the Berlin Philharmonic. I mean, the concert went all right, but this was a very distant bunch of players to communicate with. And um, I know other people get on with them real well. I, I just didn't. Is some of that perhaps some um, old world chauvinism towards a brash young American conductor? I mean, I, I sometimes feel this even in this country that uh, the United States still somehow looks for looks to Europe for cultural leadership, and I, I sometimes think that we are somehow seen as seen as usurpers um, <laughs> with all the vitality which is going on. It's here. it does still play, although you know I've I've sort of thought about this a lot because I get asked a lot about the you know, Americans at home and, and how we are abroad. These days, Americans are doing a little better in Europe than um, they used to do. When you think that the Vienna Philharmonic virtually are embracing Mr. Bernstein now, and Jimmy Levine is very, very popular there. Jimmy Conlon has the Rotterdam Philharmonic, and Lauren Mazel has the Orchestre de Paris. So Americans are, are faring pretty well in Europe, and a certain degree better than they are at home. Um, but then again, you know, none of the London orchestras right now is headed up by a British conductor and the two orchestras in Paris are headed up respectively by an American and an Israeli, and the Vienna Philharmonic is an Italian as its music director. So it's sort of a worldwide epidemic. You're not to be a music director. Even the Concertgebouw went to an Italian all of a sudden. It was very, you know, the Munich, the Bayerische Rundfunk is now an English conductor. So uh, I guess somehow there's still this stigma attached to if you're from our own country, you probably aren't quite good enough. So it's not just in this country we have that uh, problem. But we do take away a lot of the European conductors. And in, unfortunately, in some cases, we take away some not so good ones just because they're European conductors. And they have names that are harder to pronounce. So that happens. We're going to open up the floor for some questions in just a few minutes. But first of all, um, where do you see yourself 10, 20 years down the line? <laughs> 10 <What>? pounds lighter. <laughs> Um, what do you want to uh, end up doing? Do you want to stay with St. Louis? Um, do you want to, do you have aspirations for what used to be called the Big Five? Uh, I think it's an outdated list, and I'm not mm -hmm. sure that some of the Big Five deserve uh, mention with, oh, I don't know, the little ten. But um, <laughs> but tell me, how do, you, how do you feel? What do you want to do? Ten I down the line? have been asked a lot about, oh, when are you going to leave St. Louis and go to one of those other prize orchestras. And then we get through two concerts like we had this weekend, and I go, why would I want to leave that? Why, when I've spent seven years trying to build something molded in an image of what I've had in my mind, and which there's still work to do, why would I want to stop doing that? So that's the first thing. The second thing is that, um, and it's awkward to say in New York, but there is something about not living in New York that is appealing, and it is this for me. In a city like St. Louis and certain other cities in this country, you are under no obligation to compete with anybody else. So that whatever growth I can accomplish with myself and with my orchestra, I can do at my own pace. And if other people say, oh, he's not growing fast enough, that's too bad. I can, I don't, I'm not pushed to do something at anybody else's pace other than what I feel is proper for myself. I can do that both musically, personally, and in any other way that I wish to do it. Um, I have toyed with the idea of perhaps taking a European post, not for the idea of um, uh, glorification of career, because I don't think about it very much, but more with the idea of stabilizing uh, the traveling part of my life. I'm, I'm on the road now 30 weeks a year, and uh, I don't know about you, but I'm not so anxious to get on so many planes anymore. Uh, and I, I would like to maybe just 
have a little more uh, stability in, in that area. Musically, I, I must say that you know, we, we all go through points in our lives, certain things that we measure our growth by. The other night I was, for the first time in my life, able to come off stage and say that I really felt I was quite close to something special in the big C major Schubert symphony. This is a hard statement to make because you know you're not supposed to do this piece well until you're 85. Uh, but Even I felt it was that, written by a 20 yeah, uh, year old right. or something. Yeah, but this one I felt I felt I uh, you know I grew. I, I could feel it over the course of the last three weeks of doing the piece. I I could feel myself getting close to something. And if if I can do that over the next 10 years with other key works that are the works by which musicians tend to judge themselves. We all have our individual lists of these things, but I mean, um, uh, a Beethoven Fifth, I would like to progress a certain way. Uh, there's certain other pieces that just I would like to concentrate on. I, I can see that as being part of my life. Continuation and um, promotion of the young American composer, because after all, uh, it is up to us now to help shape what the repertoire will be 50 years from now. And I think that there are so many fine young composers out there that they deserve to be heard and deserve to be heard often and with as good performance as you can possibly give them. And um, really maybe a little more expansion into the operatic world which has been uh, quite active now and which I don't find as repulsive as I did three years ago. <laughs> Well, let's take some questions. Uh, anyone want to ask Mr. Slatkin any questions? Yes, please. Well, you're going to get two different answers up here, aren't we? <laughs> he, well, I think we both should answer it. Um, I <sighs> do. I want to get in trouble or not? Sure. Um, you know, my we we all go to a concert, and with any luck, everybody at that concert takes away a different feeling. Everybody. But the majority of people who were not there will only judge it by what is read or perhaps talking to somebody. And unfortunately, or maybe you feel fortunately, many people who were there will not truly make up their mind until they've read about it the next day or two. What constitutes brilliant or bad or whatever is purely a response that only you can have. And if you're honest to yourself as a listener and as a performer, you will know within yourself what it is, and you shouldn't give a damn about what anybody else says. I would agree with him entirely. Um, honest critics write as if they are one person writing, because uh, I can guarantee you that if you put any two critics uh, into a room together and made them talk about every single point, Musically, within half an hour, you'd certainly have a wild argument going on. Um, we just all feel very, very differently about things. I was talking with a, a colleague the other day about uh, Maurizio Pollini, the pianist, whom I consider one, really one of the absolutely superb musicians of our time. And I was genuinely shocked because the person I was speaking with is somebody who I have a great deal of respect for his musical taste. And he was telling me that Pellini was not a musician and was telling me why Pellini was not a musician and, and how cold he was and how, um, it, it's just one of those things. And um, as for what a critic looks for, it's, it's again very tough to say. It's, it's something almost spiritual. There, there are certain tangibles, certainly. One can talk about virtuosity and linear continuity, how much the, uh, the intention of the composer was fulfilled and also um, how much originality was also brought to bear on the interpretation. But finally it comes down to something 
really something almost spiritual, sort of an essence. Um, and I think most critics, at, at least critics, shouldn't write like they're handing down holy writ. Uh, I, for one, would be much happier if there were still nine daily newspapers and where we, there'd be a lot of us and we'd all have different opinions and then we'd all go to Luchow's and talk about them afterwards like they did in 1910, 1920. But unfortunately, it's not the way it works anymore. Easier for the performer, too, because then all I have to do is quote two papers and you know, it all looks good and the it, brochures. It, it's really much easier <laughs> for the critic, too, because it's a, it's a very... It's a very difficult thing to to sit there and know that uh, you're the only person who's writing yeah. this up for posterity. Yeah, and and you know, I, we all know about cases. It doesn't happen in music quite the same way, but we all know about Broadway shows that, on the basis of one person, go like that. Uh, it doesn't, fortunately, doesn't happen in music. And in general, musicians who are very fine artists survive all this. In fact, part of our being is the ability to bounce back from that. There have been many musicians who are very good ones and who should be heard, but they get so devastated by what they read about themselves, they don't bounce back from that. And that's, I'm afraid that's part of it. And it always has been through history. We know of cases like Rachmaninoff who was so devastated he had to you know, go to psychoanalysis for two years. There are, there are also um, many artists who really made their living on bad reviews. Grace Moore used to say that that was the way she got her name around was through her bad reviews. Um, uh, let's see, other people who were given a great deal of critical um, attack over the years. Uh, Hosea Turby was always no. being, Stokowski for heaven's sake, who's now recognized as one of the real titans of conducting uh, and was often dismissed as nothing but a glamour boy showman. You yeah. read the reviews and it's, everyone I think has had to deal with that. Also, I would, the one warning that I've had, one small one to issue, beware of fads. We have them in music just like in anything else. For a while the fad is who can do X symphony slower than anybody else. There's things like, these tend to be fads. Stuff like that. Well, watch out for them. You see them crop up, you'll see all kinds of, um, lots of operatic directorial fads these days. Lots of them. Um, yes, please. As a conducting student, I'm curious to know what your best or most influential experiences were when you were growing as a conductor. Who was your best teacher? Did everyone hear that? No. Um, <coughs> she is a conducting student and she'd like to know. Uh, what his most, uh, who his most important teachers were and his most important experiences. Am I paraphrasing correctly? I had two direct teachers. That means people I actually studied with. One was um, Jean Morel, who I studied with here in Juilliard, and the other was Walter Suskind, who I studied with at the festival in Aspen, Colorado, and then he took me on as his assistant in St. Louis. And Mr. Suskind actually gave me the most pertinent piece of advice, he said that the most important thing is to watch as many conductors as you can, especially rehearse, and not to learn so much from what they did well, but what they didn't do well, and try to analyze that and keep it out of your repertoire in terms of technique. And to a degree, that's true, because anybody can imitate. I mean, anybody can get up there and, and do this. It's not very difficult. Um, but what is hard to do is to separate when it works and when it doesn't. Usually what works is something that cannot be taught, but what doesn't work can certainly be learned. And it, it seems that every conductor has his own style, his or her own style. Yeah. You have everything from Leonard Bernstein who sort of flies all around the stage to Fritz Reiner who's used to conduct like this apparently. Mm -hmm. I think that we all, one, one if any other conductors here, you have to be careful not to conduct against the way you're built. A lot of conductors try to do physically what they are incapable of doing or what is awkward, including being left-handed. If you're left-handed, conduct with your left hand. It's not a problem. It's only another two feet away from the cellos. They'll see it. Um, so uh, I, I think that's, that's something we have to be careful about. And also, even though there have been certainly great conductors who didn't play in orchestras, I think it's real helpful at least to learn enough, of, especially about a string instrument, that you can sit in there and play, or a keyboard or something. You should play something where you are in an orchestra watching from that side and having to react as a player. So again, you would know what. My other teacher, Mr. Morell, would say that you know, every time you get it, conduct, 
If there's 100 people in the orchestra, 80 of them think they can conduct better than you can, and 20 can. <laughs> I, I saw another question. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, this has changed a lot over the years. Uh, there is a book yet to be written by somebody about, uh, indeed, how the orchestra has changed, especially in the last 15 to 20 years. Up to 20 years ago, there were no orchestras in this country which worked 52 weeks a year. Now there are 30, at least, that do that. Also, salaries, my father was the assistant concertmaster in St. Louis in 1934 to 37, I think. And at the end of his third year, he went to the conductor, Mr. Goldschmann, and asked for a $5 raise. Mr. Goldschmann said, you can't have it. My father left, went to California, and did okay. These days, basic salaries in major orchestras have gone so far as to be $1,000 a week in some orchestras. That's minimum. You, you audition, you're in the orchestra, boom, $52,000 a year, just like that. And we're not talking about the majority of the players who get over that scale. So with the added salaries and with the great strengthening of the unions. A conductor, for instance, can no more go, you, third base, out, you're fired. You can't do that anymore. Uh, for, for good reason. I mean, you have to go through a long process if you're going to do it, and many times it doesn't succeed. So job security has increased so much for the players, in addition to salary, so you don't see as much turnover as before. Uh, when there's a vacancy, for instance, we have a second violin vacancy now in our orchestra. Um, and we had 208 applicants for a second violin section position. Uh, that's a lot. So we, if we had, you know, if we had a first trumpet opening, we'd be auditioning for, you know, two years. Every trumpet player would show up and that's it. Um, it has changed. And I think the good news about that would be that as this stability really centers and there are less and less changes, with any luck, the people who are in those orchestras now are very good and the level of playing will only rise because the interaction among the players should get better year after year. Depends on the relationship of the music director to his orchestra or her orchestra for that matter. But if it's a decent relationship, the orchestra should continue to rise. I think um, Tim pointed out earlier that there's now maybe not such a difference between what was called the Big Five and any of the other orchestras. And it is true that on any given night in this country, you can hear great performances by between 15 and 20 different orchestras, and they would be very hard pressed to say which one's better than another one. So not so much a problem now in the, in the turnover department. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Well, I think that the first thing you do is not to <laughs> not to conduct the piece, which are up there for a reason. Um, I think that usually if, if I'm working with one of them, and I did have the chance relatively recently to work with Mr. Ashkenazi, the first thing you do is you play repertoire that they probably wouldn't be conducting from the keyboard anyway. Um, in his case, it was uh, D minor Brahms. Although I know one example of a pianist that did conduct it from the keyboard. I didn't hear it, but it must have been very interesting. Uh, I can't remember ever getting into a discussion. I worked with Pinky Zuckerman this year in the Beethoven Violin Concerto, and certainly he's conducted it from the violin enough times, but I can't remember ever talking to him about how he approached it differently from conducting it as opposed to playing. I think you simply keep the relationship of conductor and soloist, and if it's somebody you respect and admire, you're, you're just both going to collaborate on getting the best result possible. And I think since we, I see at least two distinguished soloists here, they could tell you that there's a big difference between playing and conducting and the, the nature of the result. There's a, certainly a lot more um, flexibility when there's a conductor there, I think. You, you can react to each other a little bit more easily. Uh, I, either one of you guys, Jeffrey Siegel and Emmanuel Axe are here with us, by the way. And if, if either of you want to chime in on that one, because it's hard for me to answer that. Well, what do you do when there's a real disagreement? I'm thinking of the... Go with the soloist. Yeah. There, you, you know, I, the last thing I want to do is disrupt a, 
You know that famous yeah. story about Bernstein and Go Gould, ahead. even though it's been blown entirely out of proportion, is that there were disagreements on how the, the same concerto, the Brahms D minor, should be played. And what finally happened is that they agreed to disagree, and Bernstein went out before the New York Philharmonic public and said that he disagreed with Mr. Gould, but that he respected him and was going to try playing it his way. It's, it's actually a fantastic performance. If you, it's a, yes. around on some pirate tapes. But um, what would happen if you were in that situation? I will tell you about you one. You had somebody who was very different from Yeah, Gould I'll tell you about one. So right, Jeffrey? I won't mention the name. Is this, is this over? Hold it. Wait. Yeah, okay. You'll have to take my word on this one. I had the occasion with the second Rachmaninoff Piano Concerto. Yes. I, uh, somehow I ran into a string of very, very... Uh, unusual interpreters in a row, like four of them. And for the first three, I kind of gritted my teeth and got through it. I don't know why, and it still eludes me, in a piece where we have recorded documentation by the composer, which gives us more or less guidelines about how this piece should go, why somebody, anybody would go so far astray just to say, well, this is what he really meant. Well, we know what the composer really meant by the playing, or at least within whatever. So I'm conducting in this one place, and the pianist comes, and uh, he said he wanted to meet with me an hour before the uh, first rehearsal. First of all, I asked for two rehearsals, which in that piece is a little strange to do. And I thought, OK, meet an hour before, which is also strange in that piece. And there's only a certain amount of things that you need to discuss with a pianist in that work. And he said, I play this piece very differently than anybody else. It's fine, okay. And he proceeded to, and I'm not exaggerating, I'm not. This is what it started like. It's not easy to do standing up, but he didn't do it sitting down either, so. This is what the beginning was. <laughs> over it was played short. Everything that was short notes, the pedal went down. He left the left hand out half the time. Uh, the clarinetist, there's a clarinet solo with the, the, the piano has to play just triplets to accompany the clarinet. And this is da, 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 da. The clarinetist is you know, getting a hernia trying to figure out how to fit it in. And I uh, called the management over <laughs> after the rehearsal. I said, you can't. It's not... This is insulting to the orchestra to have somebody like this. He has no idea what he's doing, none. I've never done that before. And I said, please, I have a list of people. <laughs> Here are three people just off the top of my head that I don't care if they show up two minutes before the performance. I don't have to rehearse it with them. Just get one of them, please, and get rid of this guy. And um, we fortunately were able to get Mr. Siegel. In fact, he even made it to a rehearsal. And he remembers it. He came out for the rehearsal and started. Forgive me, Jeffrey. He started going. Played the first seven parts. The whole orchestra cheered. <laughs> and the funniest part of that story actually was that we were sitting in the coffee shop with the management and myself, and we were discussing it. And they finally they'd agreed. Yes, they'll ask him not to perform. And he was five booths away, this poor guy. And he comes walking by and he says, you know, it, it'll be a lot better tomorrow. And I said, right. <laughs> that was the end of him. So, that, but that's, that's a real extreme. I've never had, other than that, a, a case where I, unless it's somebody who's indisposed and is, is ill, they, they want to try to go on. And we say, look, you really, you really shouldn't. This is not in your best interest. Um, it has taught me, of course, the lesson of never again will I, unless it's absolutely necessary, appear with somebody who I either don't know, haven't worked with, or heard. That was, you know, we all learn 
from this kind of thing. This, this is, of course, an extreme example, but yeah. I want to touch on something which you mentioned a moment ago, uh, the idea of documentation, because I agree that um, recordings are very important, but do you think that, uh, say, a a composer is necessarily the best interpreter of his own work. For instance, I think most of the Stravinsky recordings are pretty <coughs> disappointing. Yeah. I mean, they're, they're interesting to hear, and they're fascinating as documents, as sort of a, um, oh, a concordance to the score, but um, as the most, satisfi the most satisfying interpretations, they're not. I think there's a bigger problem than that. I, I agree with that. Um, only in a couple cases where the composer happened to be a very fine conductor, like a Benjamin Britten, mm -hmm. or Boulez for that matter, who know, you know, they know exactly what it is that they're looking for. But I find a bigger, a bigger problem. The majority of composers record their music long after the piece has been written. So the original impetus and inspiration for the work, not that it's been lost, but it's been altered by the years. And this so-called, what did the composer really intend when he wrote it, has not only disappeared um, from the performance here, because the composer can't remember. And I find it very unusual that we sit around arguing about Beethoven metronome marks and how we have to be scru scrupulous to these when virtually no composer of our time follow their own metronome marks. I'm serious. It's You, you can go through almost all of the standard composer-conducted works assume that this is how they would like their works to be performed, and they don't follow their own markings. Why, therefore, should we assume that Beethoven was any more or less accurate or inaccurate? So I think there's a great problem about especially taking the composer since, so literally. Especially since a lot of the Beethovens cannot be played by most yes. pianists, certainly. Yeah. Um, any other questions? Uh, yes, sir. That's obviously... Did everyone hear that? Yeah. Oh, oh, go ahead. Go first. Ahead. Everyone hear that? Uh, the, the question was that he mentioned earlier that there was, that the, uh, the Beethoven Nine were um, towering examples of genius. I'm paraphrasing a little bit here. Uh, towering examples of, of genius. Uh, what sets them apart from, say, the works of a Tchaikovsky? Is that fair? Second, say the Tchaikovsky Second uh, Symphony. Uh, right. Well, you know, we can, we can view that two ways, can't we? We can say what sets the um, nine Beethoven symphonies apart from the incidental music to the ruins of Athens of Beethoven or any other lesser Beethoven pieces. So therefore we could say what sets the Tchaikovsky VI apart from Tchaikovsky II. It's a little easier to maybe to say it that way. Not where every composer is uh, placed, first of all, in history at such a crucial point as Beethoven was to be literally a landmark. I mean, he. He is the bridge that, that, that almost no composer, other until we got to the 20th century, uh, was, had that right in front of them just to completely change musical style and the course of musical history. Composers like Tchaikovsky and the majority of the great romantic composers exist in a, a time of confluence of most of the artistic styles. And in the case of the Tchaikovsky, we have the great influence of Russian nationalism emerging. It's why the early Tchaikovsky symphonies tend to be nationalistic works, including the Second Symphony. And they reflect probably to the Russians as symbolic a greatness as any of the works of Beethoven do. Um, but they're perceived differently because they are intrinsically Slavic and especially Russian. Um, the world judges ultimately what its masterpieces are in any art form. And perhaps the, uh, the times that come up now that we bring up these other works to see why they are not the great masterpieces, that's important too. I love Tchaikovsky too. I do it all the time. It's, it's fun to do and that's a, it's a fun piece. Um, it's the kind of work where you feel you are in the presence of a great mind 
presenting a piece which is a fine piece to play, but it is not the towering work that, say, the Sixth Symphony is. Um, all, all forms of musicians, we all have that. We all have repertoire that uh, we consider to be pinnacles. And it's also a very subjective matter because, you know, um, I was having a discussion with, actually with Mr. Siegel. I don't consider, for instance, the Hammerklavier Sonata of, of Beethoven the towering masterpiece that some people do. I, it's a piece I find as a transition work. That's, and we're, we're not here to discuss that merit. But you also find people who hate the Franck D minor symphony. And other people will argue that it's a very important work in the history of music. You find, especially at the turn of our century, works of Schoenberg and Stravinsky being argued about as being either towering masterpieces or not very worthwhile. Um, the secondary pieces which are left to us by history are still very important to play, and especially if they represent the growth into something finer. We, we always must hear them. And, and play them. We, we can't just let them languor. We can't. There are a lot of pieces that shouldn't be played anymore, or at least brought up maybe every 50 years. But other works that are in the middle, the Antar Symphony, Rimsky-Korsakov would be a nice example of that, or oh, just, it's just so many. I'm doing a piece next year, the Ninth Symphony of Spohr, called The Four Seasons. It's a lovely piece. We should hear it once every 20 years. <laughs> Uh, well, the best, I, the best answer I can give you without talking about the formal structure of these pieces, because I don't learn pieces that way, is that every time you return to them, there are more and more discoveries to make and more interpretive decisions to come by, and you notice more and more. In the other pieces that perhaps are not quite of that quality, you find yourself um, not discovering so much. A Tchaikovsky too, which I say, I've, I've done a lot. I don't think I've really changed much in the way I do the piece or the way I view it or even the way I rehearse it. I try to think maybe I'll take this faster or slower, or, but, but I don't find a probing question like, how am I going to move from this chord to that one and create a, a mysterious effect? Or why did he choose to have this modulation this way? I, I somehow don't find myself drawn into thinking about that. Whereas with the perhaps with the great pieces, it requires a somewhat more analytical approach, maybe. It's a hard question to answer. Uh, uh, yes. Yes, yeah, second time around, okay? Sure. Yeah. Um, I have a tendency, every time I go to a concert, to count the number of women in the orchestra, mm -hmm. being a now woman. Um, <laughs> Assume you always were. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 I see it, and it creates a phenomenon. Mm -hmm. Because I think it's something that is very important in the history of music. Yes. Yes, there, as I know it now, there's probably just one, maybe two orchestras in the world, or the major ones, that do not have women in it. With the LSO still without women, and... Philharmonic finally has, uh, Berlin finally has Sabine. Berlin, but no, they had even one before that. Okay. People forgot that, actually. There was one before. Her issue was another one. In this country, there have been, uh, for quite a while, an increasing number of women, but that is more a result of the um, not giving women the opportunity, but the nature of audition procedures being fair. A lot of orchestras audition their members behind a screen, so you do not know if it's a man or a woman to begin with. Um, I don't advocate. We do it because the union requires it, but I don't like it, um, simply because I think people go to a concert to see the music as well as to hear it, so I'd like to see the people playing it. Um, I, th I think in music, music has always been a very liberal art and the musicians, for the most part, politically think in liberal terms, although the major supporters of orchestras tend to be conservative thinkers. And um, I, I, I think most orchestras are picking people simply on the basis of do they play better or not. The interesting thing is my orchestra was the first one many years ago, like in the 30s and 40s, had a woman first trombone player. 
now we have a woman principal trumpet, and people are still shocked that it's that I have to refer to a woman player. I don't usually, but when the question comes up, that's how it is. Educations yeah. open up quite a bit. Too. Yes, education you find. You're no longer given a flute or a harp if you go to a music conservatory and you're a woman. <laughs> no, it seems. No, a lot of female percussionists now. Uh, it, it's pretty cross-section of of players. It's, I can't think of any. A real prejudice going on that way. There used to be. It, it, orchestras were very much bastions of the European philosophy of it was musicians, it's men, and that's it. Tails. Boom. Yes, uh, yes ma'am. I would hope just as the future of men conductors. I would like to think very good. But as with any groundbreaking kind of field, you have to start out being better. And so we still have not yet had, and it's not to say they're not out there, one woman who has dominated in the symphonic field yet. And I bet you there's, we, we've had three or two uh, female assistant conductors in St. Louis, and I like to think that one or two of them would go on and have bigger careers because they're very talented people, but it hasn't happened yet, and I can't answer. I don't know. I don't know. How's, how's that Tony and Brigitte doing? I don't have any idea. Do you? No, I haven't heard I don't of, know of her lately at all. Time, no. in the last four or five years. Anybody know? I, uh, did she die? I don't think so. I, I don't remember seeing that. But. Well, we don't know that. Uh, we've got time for maybe Back two there. more questions. Oh, yes, sir. Well, what do you think they said during Beethoven's time about his music? Same thing you're saying. Dissonant, disjointed. Well, you know, I'll also, I'll also, I'll, I'll give you a very big challenge. Well, let me, let me ask you this. Then, we, we all, I think, agree that to a certain degree, art has to reflect the society, doesn't it? And perhaps some of the dissonance in our society should be reflected in the music. But you would also find that these days, a great deal of the modern music tends to be more conservative. You know, fortunately, except for this nonsense going on tonight, uh, I don't know, you'll find out about it on the news if you don't know about it already. Um, fortunately, things are a little calmer. And music tends to right now be in a slightly more conservative state. But the other side is, please remember, that in 14 years, you will be listening to 21st century music. <laughs> yes. When you plan a program for an upcoming season, how much of that is uh, decided by your personal agenda of pieces you'd like to do, and how much by the places you're going to be in, the uh, I have two sets of criteria for that. One is to plan my own season at home, because I have to have a plan for the whole year for what the guest conductors do, for the guest artists, for myself, the, a variety of programming that has to take place over the whole season. That's my responsibility. When I'm a guest conductor, I usually submit 10 or so works that might appear on the second half and an opening work, depending on what soloist they've asked me to play with or I might have rejected or accepted. Um, I, what I do at home doesn't necessarily reflect what I'm going to do as a guest, except these days I'm trying more and more to duplicate pieces. So if I've done something at home, I'd like to take it to another orchestra because I'm, I'm trying now to, um, I don't want to use the word limit, but I'm finding myself overwhelmed with too many pieces to do in one season and not being able to do sometimes enough justice to one, you know, I, I don't like in one year, say, when I got fifth Beethoven coming up next year, I don't want to do it just once that season. I want to do it several places and see if I can grow. So it really is dependent on on where it's played. And for our New York programs, when you visit, it's all drawn from what we play in St. Louis. I don't tailor a program for here because it is New York. I play exactly the same stuff here that I'm going to play at home because I want people here to hear the composer and the orchestra first. That's all. We'll take one last question if there no, is one. Wait, I, do, I, I want to know if Manny's going to ask me a question or not. He, you aren't? You were going to embarrass me with a question. We'll have two questions. Oh, technical one. All right. It's a mirror, isn't it? If we're a left-handed conductor, which way is the second beat? If we're a right-handed conductor, we go one. We're in four, right? One, two is this way. 
So for a left-handed conductor, one, two. That's all. And if it's a waltz, one, two, three. One, two, three. Okay? He's set. Next. And we'll have one, one, one last question. Yes, sir. It's hard to say because, to be honest, most conductors don't see the other conductors. We're too busy conducting. Uh, then I can't judge them just by hearing about them. I can only judge by what I hear, and I cannot judge them by records. Um, I can tell you that at least the performances that I go to of the last couple of years, I've been satisfied um, by an extremely beautiful Bruckner 7 I heard Mr. Giulini do in Berlin last year. Um, I heard a wonderful Elektra that Meister Leinsdorf did at the Vienna State Opera one year. I, uh, oh, um, what else? Oh, I mean, a few others. I, I can't, I, it's hard to say because I, I unfortunately can't go to so many things. Uh, and also sometimes the Cardinals are beating the Mets and I have to go to that. So. <laughs> Well, that's a, that's a subjective matter. I don't think that one musician is necessarily in a position of being able to say what's right and wrong. Um, I might have one set of opinions about an artist, and another musician will have another set of opinions, as Tim pointed out. Um, I think the, the, what happens is that we get through these fads, and that at the end of it, the people who are the giants in our profession tend to be there for a reason. Very few people achieve the pinnacle and stay there without justification and without a good background. You know, there are very few, if any, frauds who remain on top very long. They may get up there for a couple months, but not very long. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Clapton. Or uh, Michael Tilson Thomas as well, and I wish you all a good night. Thanks for listening. For more information on the 92nd Street Y New York and all of our programs, please visit us at 92ny.org.